Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Despite the changing views in America, and even inside his own administration, why does Biden insist on zero consequences for Israel in its war on Gaza? Let's get to the bottom line. The contradiction is obvious. Talk about the need to protect civilians and aid workers, but make sure Israel faces no consequences for its actions, and then keep the weapons flowing. Wash, rinse, repeat. That sums up the Biden administration's approach to Israel's war on Gaza, even as it carries out war crimes and uses food as a weapon of war. After Israeli forces killed seven humanitarian workers for World Central Kitchen, U.S. President Joe Biden put out a statement critical of Israel. But then the White House rushed to declare its unconditional support of Israel. No change in policy. So despite the theatrical protests, is the White House setting up a new forever war in the Middle East? And what's the effect on the United States itself, where the hypocrisy is clearly visible to a lot of voters, particularly younger voters, who don't buy this equation? Today we're talking with Anel Sheline, who quit her job at the State Department in protest of the Biden administration's support for Israel's war on Gaza, and Khaled El-Gindi, a former advisor to the Palestinian Authority and now a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. Anel, you just resigned from the State Department. Uh, you put out a statement about why you resigned. You're a contractor. You're not the Assistant Secretary of State. You're not the Deputy Secretary of State. You're not the Secretary of State. You're in the woodwork of the State Department, and yet you're using this moment to focus attention on this crisis. Tell us about your decision. So, first, thanks so much for having me and for drawing attention to this issue. Um, I had thought about resigning earlier. Um, I, I was at state as a foreign affairs officer working in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, Near Eastern Affairs, trying to promote human rights in the Middle East. Um, and it had just become so difficult to try to do that in the aftermath of October 7th. Um, I, it just it felt that it had gotten to the point where I had tried to raise objections internally to the extent that I was able to, like through dissent cables, for example. Um, but eventually, it just got to the point that it seemed that resignation was really the only option left. And then when I was speaking with colleagues, they encouraged me to do so publicly in order to draw more attention to this. So I decided that I would, I would go ahead and go public um, to, to try to contribute to these efforts to push the administration to adopt a different let me, role. Let me push you a little bit further. October 7th was a trigger for a lot of different players in this drama, right? Clearly, Israel felt assaulted. Uh, in a way, and you saw a consensus of opinion inside Israel about a response that you haven't seen in a very long time. So it was a cross from left to right about, about reacting. Um, do you think that the U.S. at that moment took the right policy course in the way it supported Israel in that moment? Should it have anticipated the, what we now see as a kind of overreach and an incredible impact on Victims, casualties among civilians, civilian kids, women, even men. I mean, I, I have to tell people, I keep seeing white flags go up, and that's almost a sign to be shot. So what, tell us about that dynamic. I, I think the fact that President Biden came out in his response warning Israel to not react the way the U.S. did after 9-11 was really wise on his part. I think, unfortunately, there was no effort to actually try to ensure that that didn't happen, the sort of overreaction we saw from the United States in the aftermath of 9-11 and the, this overreaction from Israel, you know, we know that the Israeli military is capable of carrying out very precise surgical strikes, and that is not the approach that they've taken in Gaza. I mean, based on my understanding of what we're observing, this is a policy of collective punishment that they are trying to engage in, in ethnic cleansing to try to remove the population of Gaza um, to, to make life so unlivable there that people cannot survive or are forced to leave and, and to take over that territory. Um, I think another important thing to keep in mind here is that, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu's political future depends on this violence continuing, and he has no incentive to either get his own hostages back or to end the violence. Um, so I do think the U.S. administration is just being somewhat naive or, you know, willfully blind to the political incentives on Netanyahu's side when they keep pushing, you know, they, they keep talking about their efforts to push for a ceasefire but are not using American leverage to get there. Khaled El-Gindi, I've been reading um, your work 
um, intensely uh, for now almost half a year. It's almost half a year uh, of this crisis um, going on. And the gap between what we hear about President Biden talking about the fact that we need to minimize casualties, we minim need, you know, Israel needs to minimize uh, impact on civilians, et cetera, and then the lack of conditionality on this. I'm just interested both from your own perspective as someone who knows the Middle East well, but also the hypocrisy that, that Americans are watching in an election year and how that gap is going to play out. The reality is that not only is the American public not there, and specifically Democratic Party constituencies have, um, I think, are increasingly vocal and angry at where this administration is, but even inside the Washington policy establishment itself, you know, we hear very mainstream voices, uh, both Democrat and occasionally also uh, Republican voices, saying um, the president looks weak, uh, the president is being led by uh, an extremist uh, prime minister with his own survival uh, in mind and uh, who is himself beholden to a band of extremists in his coalition. Uh, and the president is constantly being humiliated um, with by the Israelis who are thumbing their nose uh, at the president and Secretary Blinken at every opportunity. Well, let me, let me uh, interrupt you there just for a second, Holly, and ask you, is... Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's political survival undermining President Biden's political survival? Yeah, it seems so. It's pretty remarkable to me, and it really shows, I think, the extent to which this president is blinkered, um, is willfully blind uh, to certain realities. And I do think that it is kind of caught up in the person of Joe Biden. I think most people in the administration have probably moved on in their thinking. Um, but the real kind of, um, you know, it's, it's the person of Joe Biden who is the reason that we are stuck where we are. Well, this takes us back to Anel Sheline and her resignation from the State Department. I think a lot of us are struggling with whether you are a boutique actor or you represent um, many others who share this perspective, whispers in the hallways, discomfort with the direction of the administration. We've seen letters from donors. We've seen... Uh, anonymous letters written by White House staff and others. There are very few who have stepped forward, Anel, and done what you did and resigned your job and position. And as you wrote in your eloquent essay in CNN, uh, this may foreclose a future for you in Foreign Service. And so you, you, you put this whole, how, how unique are you in this environment right now? Are there others out there that share your perspectives? Many people share this perspective. Um, people inside state, many of them want to do that work because they believe in what the United States says it's supposed to stand for and they believe in the work they're doing. Many people are doing extremely important work on Gaza and on accountability measures for Israel, but those won't come into effect unless Biden wants them to. So there, there, there are efforts sort of waiting in the wings, but until they get a sign off from the president, they're not going to be put in place. So, you know, I think for many people who work at state, they, they would like to still believe in the work that they're doing, or especially if they're working on this issue, they are doing everything they can to try to shift U.S. policy here. But again, those kinds of decisions get made at the very top. But what I was struck by was how you felt that no one was returning your calls, that America doesn't have voice on this anymore. Tell us what the implications of that are. So, I mean, just to be clear, I, I was working on, you know, human rights issues, not, you know, Israel-Palestine was not one of the countries in my portfolio, right. um, but my work was impacted, you know, very significantly by the conflict, um, partly because civil society in the Middle East and North Africa in the wake of October 7th and the, the U.S. response didn't want to have anything to do with the U.S. government. The U.S. had lost all credibility as... Um, uh, an entity working to promote human rights. Um, in addition, it just became that much more difficult for the U.S. government to criticize any of these Middle Eastern governments about their own human rights record, such that there's, there's a meeting with a foreign official, for example. Usually our office would try to emphasize a, a particular case or concerns around, you know, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association. Um, you know, political prisoners. But in this context, 
that doesn't get emphasized as much, it's not a priority, or, you know, the immediate reaction from the government is, who are you to lecture us about human rights? Um, to your question of how widespread is the sentiment, I mean, people are devastated. There are, there, the State Department has held listening sessions for, for people to talk about this. Um, there have been multiple dissent cables. I co-authored one. I signed two more. I don't know how many there have been total, but my understanding, um, there, you know, people are very concerned and they are trying to speak up. Um, I do think that overall, the the broader question here for people inside state, although they try to remain apolitical, there are a lot of concerns about what this means for U.S. politics. I mean, the right. Trump administration really undermined the State Department. And people welcome this administration's pledges to reestablish U.S. moral leadership, to emphasize human rights, to engage in international institutions like the U.N. And in the wake of October 7th, it's become clear that those things are, are not, in fact, the priority. And what is the priority is this unconditional U.S. military support for Israel and political support, um, like in the U.N. So. I think many, many people just feel very betrayed. Um, I know there are more people who have resigned quietly. We haven't seen many public resignations, I think in part just because it's part of the culture of the State Department to not sort of, you know, seek the spotlight or, um, you know, the, just so much of that work is done quietly and out of the public eye. So I think for many people, they're just not really accustomed to that, you know, to, to coming out publicly like this. Right. Well, I want to get your reactions to a soundbite we have um, from National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby responding to the aftermath of the death of seven World Central Kitchen aid workers. We continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place. And to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in real time. Anel, I want to ask you to respond to John Kirby's comments that specifically mentioned the State Department. To me, sound a bit Orwellian. How do they sound to you? Um, it's, uh, I, I would just counter that um, reality is fairly clear here. We have other governments and other international institutions, bodies around the world that have demonstrated very clearly the ways in which Israel is, is committing gross violations of human rights, war crimes, um, in, in this, in, you know, as you mentioned, directly targeting journalists, targeting aid workers, targeting hospitals and healthcare workers, <laughs> on top of just massacring civilians. The State Department is not yet ready to acknowledge that because that would necessitate a different course of action. Israel is violating U.S. laws here. So, for example, the Leahy laws are not being applied or Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act. These and other laws would require the U.S. to change its behavior. But until the White House is ready to take a different approach here, the State Department is not going to acknowledge that. And so we are going to continue to see, as you said, this sort of Orwellian disregard for the truth, which again gets back to some of my concerns about this all is starting to sound very Trumpian or just the ways in which reality is denied. People can see with their own eyes what's happening. They have direct accounts from social media, from people inside Gaza, and and yet this administration doesn't seem to have caught up to the fact that they've lost the narrative here, they can't continue to just treat this as a PR issue to be managed, that they have to take a different approach or they do risk not only, you know, losing the, this election, but sort of the, the credibility of the United States on the world stage writ large. I mean, this, this administration likes to talk about great power competition with China, with Russia. We have the, obviously, ongoing Ukraine conflict. And the, there's a lot more at stake here. As, as Khalid mentioned, I mean, it's devastating for the people in Gaza, but it's, it's much bigger than that right. as well. When you listen to the perspective we just heard from the White House on the Biden administration versus some of the other voices that are also very sen senior in parts of the U.S. government, what do you make of it? I think there's something 
going on here that a lot of people don't know about. Um, you know, when in in the in the minds of Israeli military and political leaders, they are not committing war crimes. They genuinely believe that they are abiding by at least a version of international humanitarian law. But they have a very different standard as to who is a legitimate target and who isn't than we do here in the United States or that most Western nations do. Holly, they don't talk about, yeah. What will that standard look like if Rafah is attacked in a full-scale attack uh, by Israel, which we know um, they have an interest in doing? And actually, U.S. war planners are now working with them in some ways uh, on, on Rafah, where the bulk of the population in Gaza has swelled into that. Yeah. What will that calculation look like then? If we take the, the uh, open source reporting on this uh, at its face, we know that the deliberations are not going well. Um, the Israelis presented a plan for moving a million people, but they had no contingency for how they would be uh, fed or what kind of water source they would have, uh, what kind of sanitation. I mean, these were, these were not factors in, in the Israeli calculation. And we're told that these meetings got quite heated. So my sense is that Israel is going to move forward regardless of what the U.S. thinks, uh, because, at, because as we already pointed out, right now Israel is looking at what the United States uh, is demanding as, as a recommendation, right. right? They have no reason, you know, they'll take it into consideration, but at the end of the day, they will probably discount it, uh, because right. there is no or else. There is no consequence to completely... Uh, ignoring what the administration says. And in fact, there's quite a strong incentive to disregard uh, what uh, the United States wants to do because of Israeli public opinion, because of Netanyahu's own political survival. Right. Uh, and, and so I don't see that trajectory changing. Now, I know that you are acting. Uh, you, you have a belief in a political stewardship of the responsibilities you have, and you've taken a political act in your resignation. But I want you to put on your mathematician hat uh, for a moment. And uh, we just saw a political primary in the state of Wisconsin, and 50,000 people voted uninstructed. That is a vote not for Joe Biden uh, in that primary. Joe Biden, in the last election against Trump, won that state by 20,000 votes. We saw similar activities in Michigan. As you look at this and you kind of look at the political tectonics of people either voting for someone else or abstaining, do you think that this conflict, which would be the first time I think we've seen a, a foreign affairs issue matter so much in an election, do you believe, given you're young, you're, you're tied with folks, you're talking to them, do you think this will have that much consequence? Absolutely. I, I think one, one thing that I worry about a little bit is that the Democratic establishment may assume they've sort of lost those voters, so there's no point changing tack now. And they may have lost some. You know, I've certainly been in touch with, with people who say there's no way they would ever vote for him. But I do think that if this administration took a different tack and, again, merely imposed American laws, just follow U.S. law, which they are required to do, which would mean cutting off U.S. military assistance to Israel and insisting that aid is allowed in and insisting on a ceasefire, many people would be willing to vote for a president who did that. Because I think, as you said, it is unusual the extent to which we're seeing a matter of foreign policy playing such a big role here. I do think, you know, it's April. There is time to shift here. There are so many people who could be saved if Biden just took a different approach. Right. Um, I think the concern is, as we get closer and closer to the election and things just get worse, not only this the coming decimation of the people sheltering, trying to seek refuge in Rafah, but also Israel just bombed the embassy building, the Iranian embassy building in Damascus, and is threatening to invade Lebanon. We know Americans are fed up with forever war wars. If Biden doesn't stop Israel from expanding this conflict into a region-wide conflagration, there's no way he's, you know, Americans are so tired of this, of, of these forever wars. So I, I, I'm, again, we've already said that we're sort of confused by right. the ways in which this administration is, is acting against, 
American interests, against right. their own electoral interests. And it's, it's just right. unclear why they're not taking a new approach. All right, thank you. Holland, I'm going to give you the last word here and, and uh, ask you to answer a question that kind of confuses me. Where are the rest of the leaders in the Middle East at this moment? Um, why aren't they putting conditions on their own relationship with Israel, Jordan, Egypt, others? Where is the, the broader uh, uh, response from the Middle East to this, which seems like they've got a foot in and a foot out of consequential decisions? We're talking a lot about the United States not putting conditionality on its relationship. Why aren't other Middle Eastern states doing that? We'll have to make this the last word. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a really important question. I, I think part of it has to do with um, the, the this is the United States. It's very hard to defy the United States. Uh, I think also we have to look at the nature of these regimes: uh, Egypt, Saudi, the UAE, uh, Jordan. These are authoritarian regimes that have quite uh, quite atrocious human rights records of their own. Uh, their, you know, human rights is not a particular priority for them, uh, either for their citizens, uh, much less the citizens of, of other countries. Um, uh, so it, they're really all about uh, about interests uh, and and their own parochial interests of, of the survival of the regime. So whatever they think is uh, can can promote that goal. Right. Um, and and. Conversely, if they see the Palestinian issue as possibly posing a threat to their regime, we see a little bit of that in Jordan. Uh, the Jordanians have been the most vocal, probably, of, of Arab states in opposing what Israel is is doing in Gaza, in large part because they are uh, they have a population that is mostly Palestinian, uh, and and the you know the the monarchy there is doesn't feel uh, all that stable. Uh, so, so this is a factor, I think, for for Arab public opinion. Um, but there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of hesitation. People are not able to to go out into the streets uh, the way they did, to, say, during the the Arab Spring uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, there's fear uh, from their own regimes. Um, there are major crackdowns on on anyone trying to right. organize. So all of these, I think, are are mitigating factors. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your candor. Former State Department officer Anel Sheline and Khaled El-Gindi at the Middle East Institute, thank you so much for being with us today. So what's the bottom line? What happened to World Central Kitchen is telling. Here you have an organization that was getting significant amounts of food to Palestinians in Gaza, while the United States government talks about building a seaport by summertime to get aid in, as Israel continues to use starvation as a weapon of war. Jose Andres, the chef that started World Central Kitchen, says Israel targeted his aid convoy systematically, car by car, killing seven of those he calls angels. But what happened to those innocent workers is exactly what we've seen happen to thousands of innocent Palestinian children, women, and men, now more than 33,000 killed by Israel. Waving a white flag does nothing to stop a tank gunner, a drone operator, or a sniper's deadly bullet. Despite the reports of anger in the White House at Israel's actions, nothing has changed in the unconditional U.S. support for Israel's attacks on Gaza. The hypocrisy is obvious. Widespread famine is imminent, and the death and destruction just go on. Given all of this, sadly, it would just be wrong to believe that there will be a fairy tale ending. And that's the bottom line.